Hello Year 6, welcome to History Lesson 1, where we'll begin our topic of World War II. By the end of this unit of work, you'll be able to understand how life changed in Britain during World War II. Today, we'll be answering the question, why didn't Germany win the war in Europe in 1940? Before we start our lesson today, however, I want you to pause the video in a moment and answer the following questions in your knowing more and remembering more. Included here are questions about our last unit in Autumn 2. Well done, here are the answers. Feel free to pause the lesson and go over them at your own pace. I hope you get them all right. Today we're going to learn about the key military events of the war. We're going to understand the reasons why Germany didn't win the war. And we're going to evaluate why Germany missed their opportunity of winning the war in 1940. Let's have a look at your vocabulary for today. In the green box, we have words that you should know. We have war, Nazism, Hitler, World War II. And over in the grey box over here, we have words that you'll meet today. Blitz, Battle of Britain, Dunkirk, bombing. Pause the lesson and take a note of these words as by the end of our unit, you will then have a mini glossary of words that relate to our learning of World War II. And here is our knowledge organiser for this unit of work. This is also available on Purple Mash for you to print out or just have on screen for your own reference. Remember to use them how we use them in class. So to assist you in your knowing more, remembering more, your independent tasks, and importantly, to revise from. Today, we will be looking at the following sections. Here are some sources. Sources tell us something about history. It may be a document, a picture, a sound recording, a book, a film, a television programme, or even an object. Any sort of artefact from the period in question that conveys information can qualify as a source. So, what do these sources tell us about history, in particular, World War II? Pause the lesson, have a think, and make a note of your thoughts. Great job. Let's have a look together. Looking at this paper, I can see that the German forces invaded Poland. And I know when they invaded Poland too, 1939. And I can also see that Britain responded to this invasion of Poland. As I look at this newspaper over here, I can see that the British Empire is mentioned. I can see that the British Empire as a whole is involved. I can also see right here that France joins Britain in declaring war on Germany, where it says France will fight to Chamberlain tells empire. Here's another source telling us something about history. It's a map. It's a map of Europe in 1940. What does this source tell us? Pause the lesson, have a think and make a note of your thoughts. So, in 1940, Germany controls most of Europe. How do I know this? Well, we can see the help of this key over here. That the grey area is vast, isn't it? And it shows us that Germany has occupied many countries in Europe, including France, Belgium, Netherlands, Denmark and Austria over here. And the purple, the purple shows us the Soviet forces occupancy in the east is quite vast too, which includes Latvia and Lithuania. This shows us that the Germans are actually in a very good position to win the war. So what happened? Have a think. Looking at our sources then, the question naturally arises, why didn't Germany win the war in Europe in 1940? Germany occupied Poland, Czechoslovakia and France. 
and they had what seemed to be the best military advantage to win the war. But they didn't. Let's take a look at the event of Dunkirk. Dunkirk's a key word today, so I'd like you to take a note. It's a French port and a turning point for the Allies in World War II. Early in the Second World War, in late May 1940, the Allied forces of British, French and Belgian troops were trapped by the invading German army on the coast of France and Belgium in the area around Dunkirk. There was a desperate and near miraculous rescue that followed. Controlled from Dover Castle in Kent, it saved the Allied cause in Europe from total collapse and was the biggest evacuation in military history. Operation Dynamo is what it was called, it was its code name. And they rescued 550,000 troops who were ferried to safety across the Ch English Channel. Let's have a look at some footage. A curtain of darkness hangs over the coast of Britain. The dark shadow of ships flash their signals to the shore. As dawn breaks, Pathé Gazette's cameraman is on a tiny merchant ship. He is risking his life to bring you the pictures. He is on his way to Dunkirk. Every few seconds he sees other ships returning, ships of all shapes and sizes, manned by sailors and merchantmen of... Wireless operators are at their posts. Each ship is filled with the men of the BEF and of the French army in Flanders. They are on their way home. Home from the hell that is Dunkirk. Since these pictures were taken, we have all heard the full story from the Prime Minister of how the Royal Navy, using nearly a thousand ships, has brought back nearly 350,000 men. Now you are off burning Dunkirk. Now you are to see that evacuation in progress. You will see the Navy in action, Nazi planes overhead. You will see the beaches of Dunkirk under enemy fire, our own guns replying. You will see the calm waters dotted with hundreds of men as they wade or swim out to the ships. Here in pictures is the triumph that turned a major military disaster into a miracle of deliverance. Here, in one staggering shot, the Allied armies come out from the shore. That one amazing picture symbolises the miracle of deliverance, which in the words of the Prime Minister was achieved by valour, by perseverance, by perfect discipline, by skill and by unconquerable vitality. All the might of the German Air Force failed to stop them. We beat them back, we got our armies away, and the enemy paid fourfold for our losses. And now we're on our way home. The ships are gliding into a British port. The men of the BEF are stepping once again onto British soil. The men who were carried out of the jaws of death. For a time also we are playing host to thousands of French soldiers. Let us show them how we feel about the way they fought side by side with us. But the greatest tribute must go to the men of the rear guard. Their job was to fight on until the evacuation was almost complete. They have suffered terribly. They have left behind thousands of dead. They fought their last battle from the water's edge before they dived in and swam out to the ships. Most of them are very dirty and pretty ragged, but they're unshaken and not a bit shy. Now we look to the future. The BEF will be rebuilt under its brilliant commander, Lord Gort. We shall go on to the end. We shall not fail. We shall fight on the seas and on the oceans. We shall fight in the air. We shall fight on the beaches, in the fields, in the streets and on the hills, as we fought in blazing Dunkirk. And like the men who smashed their way on the hellish beaches of Flanders, we shall never surrender. In the video we've just seen, we saw really huge army vessels, but as well as the large ships, small personal boats were also being sailed across the dangerous waves of the channel to rescue soldiers trapped on the beach of Dunkirk.
Everyone was passionate about getting them back. People's morale was boosted. That means people felt happy back in the UK. And it cheered them up and got everyone ready for the next major event, the Battle of Britain. Hitler planned to invade Britain, but the RAF, the Royal Air Force, fought hard to protect the country from the sky against the Luftwaffe, which directly translates from German to English as air weapon. The Luftwaffe were a group within the German Air Force. Britain's RAF beat Germany's Luftwaffe after a long series of battles from July 1940 to June 1941, which included the Blitz. On this slide, I want you to read on further about the Battle of Britain before we watch a short documentary about the devastating bombing of London's docks in the Second World War by the Luftwaffe. The long, hot summer of 1940 was a scorcher, with temperatures in the 90s. Who would have dreamed that this was wartime? Certainly not Londoners, many of whom continued to visit seaside resorts such as Brighton, Margate and Southend for the day, just across the channel from occupied France. Little wonder they called it the phony war, until the government said otherwise. It's important that we should be prepared against death. Put it on for 10 to 15 minutes, one day a week. It may be a little irksome at first, but you'll soon get used to it. Across Europe, countries were falling like dominoes. Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Holland, and then France. Here in London, unbeknown to most, the Port Authority was already preparing for war and the possibility of invasion. To the casual observer, it looked like business as usual in London's docks. Amid the teeming quaysides and busy warehouses, an atmosphere of optimism prevailed. In the period leading up to the war, the PLA commissioned a scale model of the port, together with a documentary film celebrating the wealth of its achievements. Perhaps the best barometer of the times is to listen to the pride and confidence which brims from this film. Not only is London the greatest metropolis of the world, but also, and above all, it is a great seaport, a marine city whose main channels, tributaries and backwaters are crammed with traffic. Traffic that passes to and from the open sea and through one of the most up-to-date dock systems in the world. London's port lay at the heart of a vast empire, a veritable warehouse of the world, which handled over a quarter of the entire nation's imports. Factories, engineering workshops, processing plants and shipyards lined the riverfront and nearby districts. A fact not lost on the German high command. Cripple the port and you paralyze London. Paralyze London and you kill resistance to invasion. The port of London became target area A, an area which included the Ford plant at Dagenham, huge gas works at Beckton, and the munitions factories of the Woolwich Arsenal, all en route up the Thames. Along with aerial photography, the Luftwaffe used their own model of London's port to train pilots in preparation for attacks. While London's dockers were busy loading ships, the Luftwaffe were loading a more sinister cargo. Saturday, the 7th of September, was another hot summer's day. Against the late afternoon sky, it was easy to mistake the silver glint of approaching planes for RAF maneuvers until the firestorm began. At about 5 p.m., the first of 400 Heinkel and Dornier bombers began their descent over London. Another 400 arrived around 8 p.m. to continue the attacks. Damage to the docks was devastating, and many lives were lost north and south of the river on what quickly became known as Black Saturday. 
incendiary attacks began fires which burned for five days. Not since the Tooley Street Fire of 1861 had South London endured such widespread destruction. On the North Bank, cargoes of flour, paint, rubber and sugar sent an inferno of flames into the night sky which was visible for miles around. This little scene footage filmed by the London Fire Brigade is from September the 25th, 1940, after 18 days of successive bombardment. Aftermath, Prime Minister Winston Churchill toured the stricken areas. Traveling on the PLA launch, Nor, he took to the Thames to review the damage inflicted by enemy action. Here, Churchill is seen examining damage to flour mills at the Royal Victoria docks and the devastation inflicted on the nearby community of Silvertown. London and its port remained a prime target for the next four years. Despite ferocious air raids, as well as V-1 and V-2 rocket attacks, the docks continued to operate. Indeed, the port played a vital role in supporting Britain's war effort, and port workers were responsible for the development of many secret wartime projects. Here's a short task for you to do. As you can see, there are three columns. I want you to sort out the images to correspond with the event and to ensure that the detail matches up too. At the moment, they're all mixed up. So you need to ensure that the image matches the event and then matches the detail. Pause the lesson and have a go. How did you get on? Here's the correct table with the answers in order. In the summer of 1940, Britain, even though they had the resources of the empire, was all alone in Europe. France had been defeated. The USSR and the USA were not getting involved. And the war in Europe seemed to be on a knife edge. Yet Germany didn't take full advantage of this. Pause for thought and think why this was. Perhaps it was due to the strengths of the British and the people of the empire, as well as mistakes made. Was it a case of missed opportunities, perhaps? Have a think and make a note of your ideas. Now it's time for your first independent task. You now need to work out the reasons why Germany didn't win the war. For each military event, Dunkirk, the Battle of Britain and the Blitz, we're going to look carefully at the reasons why the war didn't end at that time. This will help us to understand some reasons why Germany didn't win the war in Europe in 1940. Here's the table that I want you to fill out. This is uploaded on Purple Mash. It's saved as Year 6 History Lesson 1 table. Alternatively, you have a hard copy in your learning packs. So let's take a closer look at your worksheet. You have a column here which lists the three events. Next to it is another column about what happened in each event. Here's your column. You're going to fill out reasons why the Germans didn't win at this particular time, at this particular event. Now, if you can't fit your writing in this box, I'm quite happy for you to complete it on lined paper and upload it onto Purple Mash. Another task I'd like you to complete is to create a line of importance. So I want you to look at these three statements, compare them 
and arrange them in order from least important to most important. Now, these statements are also available to download from Purple Mash and they're saved as Year 6 History Lesson 1 statements. Alternatively, they'll be in your paper pack. And for those of you that want to stretch themselves and show me how awesome you are at history, why not amaze me with this challenge? I want you to think about what the Germans should have done differently in order to win the war in Europe in 1940. Now remember, all your work should be uploaded onto Purple Mash. So before the end of this lesson today, let's review our learning. In a moment, you're going to pause the video and using the knowledge that you've acquired today, I want you to fill in the blanks. Have a go. Here are the answers. How did you do? I hope you got them all correct. So our purpose of today's lesson was to prepare us for upcoming knowledge of World War II. So coming up in future lessons, you're going to understand how people's lives were affected by war. You're going to develop a sense of historical empathy. When I say empathy, I mean, how do these people feel? What are they feeling? What are they thinking? What are they going through at that particular time in history? In our case, World War II. And then you're going to be able to examine primary and secondary sources. Today, we just had a look at sources in general. We're going to be able to differentiate between the two. And then you're going to draw a conclusion about why it came to a successful outcome for the British in World War II.